and we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, Mr. Capezzi is going to be presenting our safety meeting this morning, and then we'll open it up for questions. Go ahead, uh, Joseph. I mean, Jerry. All right. Uh, morning, gentlemen. Uh, so I was tasked with uh, doing a safety presentation on uh, Herb Man Lyman Rescue. So I just put together a, a PowerPoint with some uh, videos. Um, here my screen here. Well, that looks like our dummy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I took a picture of it and sent it to my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> she asked, she's like, what kind of dummy is it? So I was like, there you go. <laughs> there you go. All right, so I just grabbed some other clips. Um, yeah, I did a little research online. Um, so big thing in the Marine Corps, you know, I was in the Marine Corps for quite some time. So just to start this thing, I put the who, what, when, where, why, uh, and how for lineman rescue. So uh, for hurt man. Um, so who, it pertains to uh, all active linemen that are working in the trade. Uh, linemen must be proficient with the training. It's required by OSHA, uh, recertification yearly, and it's a timed event. Uh, just a sidebar, uh, the rescue is done by linemen, not first responders. Um, this is due to a variety of things. Obviously, there's uh, imminent danger on and around the pole in the work area. And, uh, you know, first responders, they don't have um, the access to, to get to the injured on the pole. Um, so it's imperative, you know, the more I was digging into this, um, you know, it's crucial that your brothers that are up there on the pole, um, you know, those are guys that you work with. So, um, you know, it's, it's imperative that everybody has the, has the training, they, they know it, they understand it, um, you know, and, and the ultimate thing is, is getting that, that man down without creating a extra injury. Uh, so, so the first responders can, can help them. Uh, so what is it? It's a uh, training for pole top rescue. Uh, it simulates a, a real life rescue. And on Friday, we seen the, uh, the dummy that uh, the simulates a hurt man. Uh, some tools that you need, uh, hard hat, steel toe boats, uh, hand line, gloves, climbing hooks, screwdriver, hammer, safety belt, uh, fall restraint. Uh, when I was looking online, I don't remember if, if we went over this. Is it, is it five minutes, gentlemen, that it's supposed to be? Is that what it is? It's four. Uh, four minutes? Okay. Four. Everything that I found online, it was uh, about five minutes. So, um, so I guess we have four minutes to do that. Uh, when? It's when a lineman is hurt unconscious or needs to be rescued, safely getting him down, rendering first aid and waiting for first responders. Uh, why? Getting a person down in a safely, timely manner uh, without adding additional injury can save the victim's life. Uh, so where? Uh, that's on the work site. Uh, like Professor B was saying last week, it could be a, a remote or a, a desolate location. So if you're just out with a couple guys, uh, you might be, uh, depending on where you're working at, it could be the middle of nowhere. So um, you know, you make sure it's two and the same that, uh, you know, you can help that guy. You're preparing the safety protocol beforehand um, in case something does happen if you're out in one of those remote or desolate locations. So how? Um, <clears throat> some of the videos that I found, um, you want to assess the uh, situation and the uh, injury, de-energize any uh, active electricity that's on or around the area. Call 911, share the location. Uh, and the injury, let them know what's going on if the best that you can and uh, prepare for uh, for first aid, CPR, or the AD when you get the victim on the ground until uh, the first responders get there. Uh, and I just put uh, five quick steps on here. You want to climb the pole, uh, secure the hand line to the cross arm, existing hardware if there's any on the pole. Um, if, if needed, you could use a screwdriver. Uh, the friction of the way that you wrap that hand line um, on those things, it, it causes friction on the cross arm, the screwdriver, or the pole, and you could use it as a brake uh, to rescue the lineman and guide him to the ground. So you want to attach the rope um, around the back under the left and right arms, uh, tie the rope in front of the chest with two to three half hitches, so that'll secure it to the victim. You want to center the knot um, in the center of his body, so the victim could be let down in a straight, um, you know, uh, a straight manner. You don't want it like on the side of him so he lands sideways. Um, 
and you want to cut the harness and lower the victim to the ground once you got that knot secured. And I got two videos I'm going to share here. This thing will go to the next slide. Okay. me a second it's still loading let me see if i can get it on the side here You guys hear that we can't but that's okay i mean we can see this way he's working his way through it so this is the cross arm method gentlemen i wonder what the audio So the technique here is, is essentially the same. You get the rope over the cross arm where his hand line was hung up there. Uh, one over the top and you tie him off just as you normally would. Now you see right here, he's gonna make one more wrap around outside the insulator. And uh, again, don't cross the ropes. It's just like the uh, other one we have with the screw driver. Don't get the ropes crossed so they pinch each other. Cut it and let them down. So it's obvious on this one, I mean, he had to climb a further distance and he had to do a crossover of the neutral. Yeah. All right, this is sort of like the uh, screwdriver method, but they're gonna use the clevis as the hold point. Again, there you go. He shows you the wrong way. Don't cross the streams. There you go. That's the right way. And the screwdriver method. That snow on the ground? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why the audio is not working. I have another one where I 
this is a utility company where gentlemen had a carotid artery and those guys were out in the field and uh, they were actually doing the training. Uh, they were practicing it and then the guy actually passed out in the pool. Oh, really? The audio is not working. I, mean, I can try it. Let's see. Dummy looks like ours. I don't know why the audio is not working. I don't know. Check your volume control in YouTube and make sure your volume control in uh, your taskbar is up. Let me see if I can mute. Oh, yeah, it's, that's why. It's still not working. Huh. I'm not sure what. I have an external thing hooked up here, so I don't know why. Anyway, that's uh, the long and short of this is, you know, these guys were, uh, were practicing, and um, uh, an older guy, he had a, a carotid artery, so it um, was this guy right here. He got stuck on the pole, and uh, they performed it. I mean, they had, you know, four or five linemen over there that were all ready to jump on the pole, but they got the guy down and, and essentially saved his life. Uh, it's kind of lucky they had it uh, going on at the same time that that happened. Yeah. Cool. All right, if you could, uh, go back to your original first slide for me. Sure. Uh, second slide, sorry. A great layout here. Uh, just a couple of uh, major points to bring up, and uh, Professor Vermelin, jump in here if you're yep. got anything that you wanted to see. Um, let's see, let me get my screen bigger. Thank you very much. Uh, this point that he brings up is rescue is done by linemen and not first responders. You'll see this in, I'd say, 100% of the time. I mean, if you've got a pole fire, if you've got a pole that's been hit by a car, if you've got somebody that needs rescue, uh, all your first responders are trained in this way that uh, fire department emergency, they'll get up to the scene, but they won't approach it at all uh, okay. until a, a uh, lineman gets to the location. So obviously expediting getting there and making the situation safe is a, is a priority to you guys. So it's kind of, we did do some training with the Myrtle Beach Fire Department to be able to identify when a line's energized or de-energized for them to know when to go in there. But even with that, they didn't feel comfortable about going into a situation where suspected power lines were energized or down on vehicles or anything like that. And they'll, they'll cordon off the area. They just make a safe area to get everybody around, but they won't go in and do anything. And I, I can understand that completely. So that rescue is done by linemen, not by first responders is, is key right there. All right, also, uh, you came over here. I like the tools. Appreciate that and all the PPE when you have in the wet section. You wet your PPE. Make sure that you have all your PPE on. And I think we've discussed this before uh, multiple times out in the field. Energized or de-energized, the pole needs to be climbed with, and you'll see in the training videos that you've seen so far, this guy in the picture on the upper side, you've got to wear rubber gloves. So rubber gloves must be worn all the time from uh, ground, up to the rescue and back down to the ground. Uh, well, there's another one over here. Here's one that I've seen out there, even in the training part of it, in the house section. All right, assess the situation and injury and de-energize. There are multiple methods out there that you can call a dispatcher and he can de-energize an entire circuit. And uh, so you'll be able to go up there and do the climb that you need just by simply providing him a number that's close by. So if this guy's on a pole that you see in the uh, picture up here at the, at the top, either of those two pictures at the top, that pole is gonna have a pole number on it. And if you relay, relay that pole number you do your dispatcher, he can find what circuit it's on and he can de-energize the entire circuit. So uh, don't, don't worry about de-energizing, you know, 
100, 1,000, 2,000 customers to make a rescue. Bobby, is there anything else in here that you would like to comment on? Yeah, um, we talked about a little bit on the field Friday. Um, guys, just remember, just if it's a two-man situation, you're out in the middle of nowhere, second man that's not climbing, just remember, somebody needs to take a second set of tools to where the work's being done just in case this happens because time is of the essence on this and you just don't want to have to run a half a mile back, quarter mile back to the truck. Um, we pretty much all have cell phones, so contacting the dispatcher really shouldn't be a problem um, with a radio or cell phone, but just make sure you got that second set of tools sitting there ready just in case something does happen. Absolutely. Great one, Robbie. Thank you very much for including that. Uh, so some of the ones that I've seen out there, some of the training what I've done with, uh, and you, like you said, you got to do this once a year. In the house situation, that de-energized part, uh, that's something on everybody's mind all the time because you don't want to come up there and just get involved. That Now you've got two people tied up that are injured up there and uh, nobody would respond. Here's the one that kind of a lot of people miss. Call 911 and share the location of injury. I, I can guarantee if something happens up a pole, your adrenaline is flowing. Right. And your first inclination is, I need to go up there and I need to, uh, I need to get him rescued as quick as possible. So you call and de-energize, and that's taken care of with the dispatchers. And then you immediately put your tools on and start running up there to go get them. Well, this policy, and you've got to look out for your company policy, please. I'm sorry, <coughs> Robbie, let me know yours. Uh -huh. It was our policy that in the past, that if we had an injury up a pole, we would call for the de-energized part and we would ask the dispatchers to call 911. Well, that you're putting a double task on a dispatcher right there that yeah. kind of loses a little bit of time. So you're gonna call for the de-energized part and we changed our policy that the actual employee that's doing the rescue calls, calls 911 on his phone. Uh, yeah. Rob, Robbie, how do they do it to do? Same thing, just make sure, and that's part of just like if they have this event at any rodeo and what they're gonna do is they're gonna get on the telephone, call 911, give the location, and then um, if they have time to, if they're in a vehicle, they're gonna get in touch with the dispatcher, tell the dispatcher they've had a problem, you know, to get the supervisor out there and then they're gonna run up the pole. Right, right. So uh, this, <laughs> Has anybody ever called 911 before? I used to work for a 911. <laughs> okay. Uh, you got a little bit, when I say a little bit, you got some time wrapped up in gathering information, don't you? There, there's going to be a conversation going on between you and the 911 operator, and you're wanting to get to a guy that's up, up a pole ASAP. So give clear, concise information as far as what the 911 caller is asking for obviously location uh, sometimes this location can be hard to get to and if you need to uh, get back on the radio and call somebody else to meet them so get it w what's going to hurt here is if you get the guy rescued and start doing CPR and they can't find you and especially if you're off-road if you're down in the woods or anything like that so if you need to call a supervisor or what what whatnot to help meet the ambulance and then drive down to you to rescue. Make sure all those things are in place. Okay, Robbie, anything else? Oh, sounds good. Okay, one last thing in communications, guys. And please keep in mind of, of this, when you're giving out information and this is an emergency situation, do not use names. Uh, don't call up the call the dispatcher and say, uh, Joe Brown, he just got electrocuted. I'm going up to get him. The uh, uh, airwaves are easily monitored. Uh, people with scanners and whatnot can get this information. News agencies can get this information. And it's just better in the entire situation that if you say, I've got a man hurt, or I need to perform a met or rescue, but do not use names of the employees when when you're uh, 
doing this in this situation. There's a lot of, there's no liability to it, but I have heard some call-ins of people that were hurt and uh, it's just not a pretty scene. Any other questions from anybody on this uh, Hurt Man Rescue presentation? Carpezzi, fine job. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, guys. Do you want me to email us? Or uh, yeah, you can email it to me. I appreciate it. Well, no, no, I don't need the email. I've got the recording. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Fine job. Yeah. So, so gentlemen, you get a get a rough idea here. How long did that last with me and asking questions and all that good stuff? I say he talked about maybe 10 minutes and I talked probably another 10 minutes about the situation. So that that's a typical safety meeting and a good one at that. Uh, probably one of the better ones I've seen. So you guys that are coming along up in the process, I believe Mr. Huck is the next. Huck, yeah. Yeah, Huck is next. So Huck, be prepared tomorrow for another PowerPoint presentation, however you want to present it uh, for a safety meeting. Okay. All right. All right, so gentlemen, we're going to go over today. Uh, I've had plenty of questions over the weekend and whatnot of what needs to be included in the uh, presentation and what you need to have that is due by midnight tonight and uh, email to me. So tomorrow, our expectations are, we're, and we'll go through alphabetical order again. Uh, tomorrow, we'll have another safety meeting, and then we'll just start uh, do, going through presentations one by one, starting with Kerpezi and going down alphabetically to get those completed. So I did want to give another review of it and get make sure we've got all the pieces. And I found another website out here that you can pull some information from. So let me get in the share screen mode. So does everybody should see a Word document up there, correct? Yes. OK. All right, so these are all the components that you're going to need to have in your presentation. Going right here. If you're ready to write these down, you can. If not, I will say this and put it, this in today's D2L so you can have this Word document. First part is the generating station. And make sure you do include what generation is about, the generator itself. All right. We leave the generating station and just outside of that, what we do is we take the generation voltage and we introduce that into a step up transformer. So we're gonna take a generation voltage, which is typically a lower voltage and step up that voltage to a transmission voltage. The next component we come to is going to be a switch yard. And remember, switch yards do not have transformation in them. There's no transformation in a switch yard, so I'm not changing voltages. A switch yard acts just as a junction point, so I can go in with uh, one set of lines and come out with multiple others going different directions. Uh, now I need to transmit that transmission voltage. Those are, those are transmission lines. After I've done that, I bring my transmission lines into a substation and that substation converts my voltage down, which we got more down here, into a dig, oh, sorry about that. I'll leave that like that. It's to a distribution, substation, distribution substation. You will see out there and you'll notice, we're not including on this one, there are substations that are transmission to transmission voltages. So I can take actually take a 230 kV line into a transmission substation and convert that down to 115, but we're not gonna include that here. All right, in the substation, we have a step down transformer. It takes the transmission voltage and it steps it down to distribution voltages. Then we have bus. We'll talk about this in a picture in just a moment. We come out of the transformer with what they call bus work. Switch yard, a switch yard has bus work and a substation has a uh, bus work in it also. Now this is some of the common, I don't wanna say errors, but things that are looked up that are kind of wrong when you do your searches. After it travels along the bus, we come to a distribution breaker. A lot of uh, presentations have had a transmission breaker inside of it. If you could in this process and in your searches, bring up a distribution breaker or a substation distribution breaker is a good search word. 
After it leaves the breaker, it goes into a voltage regulator. So I'm able to raise and lower my voltage by plus or minus 5%. After it leaves the regulator, it goes out into the feeder line or main line that goes along the highways and all that. Off my feeder line, I'm able to have a fuse tap or a solid tap. These are two just different types of taps, fused or solid. And we'll discuss that in a moment. I've got a presentation I can show you. Now, I've got step down transformer here. It takes the distribution voltage and converts it to secondary. I can have step down transformers installed on my feeder poles, my fused tap poles, or my solid tap poles. A transformer can be installed on any pole that has these types of lines on it. Then I have secondary lines, service lines, and then to the meter. So I'll, is everybody got this information down and copied down? Should I yeah. go, go the other direction? Who does not have this? And I'll just give it a moment. Okay. All right. So not to say that this PowerPoint is perfect. This is another student's PowerPoint. Slideshow. Okay. okay, so first we're going to have uh, the process here and start it from the beginning and then we'll go back to our sheet and double check, check our sheet in just a moment. So we did include a generator in the generating station. Uh, some cool things to look out for here in, when you're looking at generating stations is how many uh, generators are in the station based on the picture? Two. Two units, yes, here and here. So this is a two unit generating station. This, the smokestack that you see right here, this is for the uh, gases and uh, whatnot, this, uh, the coal is burned off. And these are scrubbed here in the United States. And these are cooling towers. So I'm taking water, converting it to steam, recondensing it, cooling it, and using it again. Surprisingly, gentlemen, the lake is not here for the water that makes uh, steam that goes into the generator. That's a closed unit. The water here is just for cooling the water that's converted steam and condensed back and forth. So he includes in here, a generator converts mechanical energy obtained from an external source into electrical energy as the output. Nuclear, hydroelectric, solar, wind, and coal. Kind of short, I'd probably ask a question, well, how does a generator work? So be prepared, <coughs> be prepared to have that question. All right, step up transformer. I'm kind of liking this picture a lot that he's used. So he's actually uh, taken the, a layout here of all the way from generating station to house. He's missing a couple of components because, but he'll, he'll catch up on it. A step up transformer is used to step lower voltage up from the generator to higher voltage to disperse on transmission lines. Well, I'd probably put transmit for that dispersed word, sorry, let me go back. On transmission lines, electricity can be sent over longer distances using smaller wire. That's the reason why we have transmission. So that is definitely a good one to put in there. And you'll notice he squared out the picture here of the step up transformer. Now, thinking logically, and I'll throw this question out here to everybody that's in the room, reply back. Why don't I just, at the power plant, uh, generate at transmission voltages? Why do I need to step up transformer? Because of impedance. Anybody else? Um, because you're about to send it a far distance. That's one of the reasons why I transmit, but why do I need to step up transformer? Why don't I just generate the transmission voltages right off the generator. It's probably more cost efficient. Whoever said uh, Yeah, cost efficiency is probably one of the most better reasons and in including, you know how much insulation it takes on our transmission lines that really is in a generator, I cannot have that amount of insulation 
inside a generator. If I generate at lower voltages, I'm able to handle that voltage and get that voltage from one point to another easier off the generator than having it at a very high voltage. Two is the step up transformer. I kind of want to say it in a different term, conditions uh, the voltage and the amperage for transmission. So there, there's a reason why we'll go into Y and Delta later on, but there's a load sharing characteristic of the step up transformer that makes it easier for transmission. Okay, switch yard, real good picture here. Uh, from the step up transformer, the power is run to switch yards. Switch yards disperse voltage to different transmission lines. There are substations without transformers. That's really not the right term. A switch yard is just a switch yard. A substation is now transformation. But he's got in here, and if you look at his picture, he's got a lot of bus work and a lot of transmission um, voltages coming in, but there is no transformer in here. So if I come in on the left-hand side with a transmission line, I'm able to distribute it out in multiple directions. Transmission lines carry high voltage over long distances. Smaller wire is used so that the wire can be carried easier and the amperage can be lowered. Well, it's kind of, he kind of has it close here. What happens to amperage if I raise the voltage? Trans, to transmission voltages. Raise voltage. Lower amps. Lower amperage. And now that I have lower amperage, I'm able to use a smaller conductor. If you were to think of this as coming off the generating station at uh, 240 volts, the amperage that would be on this line would be so big, I'd have a conductor that I couldn't even handle. So that's what he's trying to say, that the wire can be carried easier. Well, load can be carried easier and the amperage is lowered. It's used for extra high voltages. Yes, lines go from switch yards to substation. That is also correct. All right, substations step down the voltage from a higher voltages to lower voltages for distribution. Totally correct. Bus bar. A bus bar is a conductor used for collecting electric power from the incoming feeders and distributes them to outgoing feeders. Bus bars in switch yards and substations are, and there's three different types down here, are really, in a, I don't see, know if you guys can see the picture well. You'll notice that a bus bar is not conductor. It, it's a solid piece of aluminum or it's a solid piece of pipe. Once I start using something solid and big like this, will it carry more voltage or will it carry more amps? Uh, amps. Amps, right. I want something to be able to distribute amperage around in my substation or switchyard that carries a high amount of amps. That's why I use bus bar. Now, when you're out there and doing your searches for your presentations and whatnot, be sure to include substation or a utility substation bus because there is plenty of information as far as electricians and electricians use bus also. Just make sure you get the right picture in this situation. So it's kind of like an internal network inside a substation or switchyard, but I'm able to distribute around in those areas high amounts of average, amperage through bus. Breaker. A circuit breaker is an operated electrical switch designed to protect an electrical circuit from damage. It stops electrical flow if it detects a fault condition. All completely correct in his uh, description. There's a fault uh, condition. There's also an overload condition. All right, it protects the system from overloads, transformer faults, and faults to ground. So that's completely correct. And he just derived this from information that he found on the internet. Now, take a look at the breaker that he's got in his picture. Is this a transmission breaker or is this a distribution breaker? Transmission. Transmission. Why would you say transmission? Because the bushings are bigger. Yeah, if you've got bushings of this size right here, you're pushing the 69 to 115 kV level. 
And if you remember, as far as the flow of our work, we're in a substation. So we're down to distribution voltages. We go from distribution voltage in a substation to the bus bar, to the breaker, okay? Did he ever say anything here about the substation transformer? No. No, he included the picture, and you guys can gather here. If you, if you have an error in here, you can talk it away. You can say that from the left, uh, from the right hand side, I have transmission voltages that go into the transformer, and out of the transformer comes what Vol type of voltage? Transmission in? Distribution. Distribution out. There you go. And you can tell by the bushing size here. Big bushing here, small bushing over here. And you'll actually see in this transformer picture, it comes up with these wires and goes directly into what, what was the next video, uh, next slide? The bus bar. The bus bar, there you go, cool. All right, uh, which one is he missing here? Breaker? Uh, voltage regulator. Voltage regulator, so to be sure to, to include that. Okay, substation voltage regulator. All right. After it releases the substation voltage regulator, it goes out onto a feeder circuit, or what we call a main line. Consider the main lines, and it transfers primary voltage, all right, distribution primary voltage. And if you take the words themselves, transmission transmits, distribution distributes. All right, fuse tap. Fuse taps are used to run power off the feeder lines onto other lines. Not 100% in the picture right here, but he does have most of it. The conductors that you see on the top of the pole are his feeder circuit, three phases of feeder line. Then he comes off the feeder line with the switch, and if you notice, he's got the red arrow here. If he came off the side of the pole and went out this direction with another line, that would be a fused tap line. He'd have to connect this to the line and come out. Same on this side. If he came out this side, attached a line and went out, that would be a fused tap line. Instead, he's got it going into what I, looks like here as a capacitor bank. You'll notice this a little bit better in the next slide. All right, solid tap. Great picture right here. Solid taps are used to run power from one, one feeder line into another. Well, is that, Totally correct, gentlemen. Yeah. Solid taps are used to run power from one feeder line. Didn't to you another. just say that was what a fuse tap line did? Well, a fuse tap line and a solid tap are both taps. So can I take a feeder line and tap off into a feeder line? Uh, no, I don't think so. No, uh, not especially in this situation. If I did it with all three phases, and could, that, then it would just be a feeder. It wouldn't be a tap anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm taking one phase right here, connecting directly to the feeder line here at the top, coming down and connecting to a line that taps off. So you'll notice in here, there's no switch, no fuse. It is solid. That's what we mean by solid. Solid tap. All right, does not protect the lines from a fault. Obviously, if I have a fault anywhere downstream on this line, it's not only gonna take, it's gonna take out this tap line and the feeder. I have no fuse protection. If I were to take one of those switches that I had in the previous slide and install yeah. it right here, take my wire down to the switch, take the wire to the bottom of the switch, come to here, then it would be a fuse tap line. The tap lines make sense. Okay. Transformer. Well, he just reverts back to the other picture because it was included. Transformers are used in turn the high voltages into lower voltage so that it could be used in homes. So I'm taking a primary voltage and I'm stepping it down to a secondary voltage and he's just got it circled in this picture right here. All right, the secondary line. A little bit of description here. Secondary lines come from transformers and are ran, run from structure to structure. So he's got it in total right here in a real short description. There's a little bit of difference. I'm gonna go back and forth here real quick to these two slides. Off my transformer, my secondary line is gonna be 12240, but secondary is defined as 
from structure to structure. That's the main part of it right there. So if I go from this pole to another pole and then to a house, the span between pole to pole is secondary. Whenever I come off a pole, either overhead or underground, and go to the meter, that's service. So I'll just do it with my mouse right here. There's a transformer installed at this location over here, and I came with a span of wire secondary from here to this pole. That would be considered a secondary span, same voltage. As soon as I come off the secondary span and connect a wire to the house, that's service. Is that understood? Secondary lines, structure to structure, service lines, structure to meter, but all the same voltage. All right, meter. A meter is a device that measures the amount of electricity consumed in a home. Pretty plain and simple. When you, uh, what, what makes a meter turn? Voltage? Uh, electromagnet. Um, voltage, amperage, resistance. Which, which one of those? The amps. Amps, right. Amps make the meter turn. So if you want to include that in there too, the more amperage I consume in the home, the faster the wheel turns. So amps turns the meter. End of presentation. Good. All right, any questions there? All right, so let me get to this website. Kind of stumbled upon this, looking at some pictures and whatnot. And we'll get it drawn over here. So you might want to do some searches out here as far as your, what I typed in was <laughs> exactly what you see right here. How, how power is delivered to your home. Now, this is from Central Alabama Electric Cooperative. Uh, it's nice if you use one like this, a good explanation that comes from a utility because they're going to give you good information and good detail. Don't, don't use wiki or anything like that because they can get off, off the path sometimes in their, in their descriptions is, uh, using this. And there's a lot of, a lot of information included in this, but it's not in order. So what's the first piece they come up with? Distribution system. Yeah, that's not to say that you can't use it though. So read through your paragraph here and uh, you, you'll be able to pull some information from it. The power transformer. All right, this is a good one. The voltage coming to the substation is at 115 or is too high to go directly to your neighborhoods. Power transformers are used to step the voltage down to an acceptable level to bring to your neighborhoods. That's a great description, gentlemen. And that's the power transformer that's in a substation. All right, a distribution transformer uh, at 25 or 13,000 volts, still too high to go directly to your home. From there, power is distributed across miles and to reach distribution transformer. Is, here you go. Reach the distribution transformer steps down to power the voltage required by your home, which is 122.40. So you can cull a lot of information out of this and put it uh, in your PowerPoints. Then he's got service drop to meter then power to your home. Then for some reason they go backwards in the process and then they, what does he say? Then they start talking about their transmission system and then they start talking about generation and they actually go into a little detail of what the turbines and generator do and what a transmission substation is and transmission lines to poles. All of this is great information. A switching station or what we call a switch yard what it does, uh, what they're generating with coal. Yeah, I wouldn't really get into mining or transporting coal. Uh, the, the actual conversion process of converting coal into electricity by steps, clean coal technology. They also include natural gas. And I think they got a little bit of uh, hydroelectric power. Safety first, 
renewable energy, such as solar and wind, geothermal, biomass, yep, they're using gas off of trash heaps. And all in all, I mean, this really gives a lot of information that you can use in your PowerPoint presentations. So I'm sure some of you have written down Central Alabama Electric Cooperative, how power is delivered to your home. That gives a lot of good information. Not to say that's the only one. And included in that, what I originally tried to do here was I went into uh, Google and I typed in uh, generating station step up transformer. And then you know that you can go by the pictures here and just click on the picture and fade to the website. But this is one that was kind of kind of impressive right here as far as the picture was concerned. First, how many units or how many generators are in this generating station? Three. Three. One, two, three. I've got three smokestacks, two, three. That's a great indicator too. You'll notice it comes out of the generating station, down here into the, what is this right here? I've got my mouse going around. What's the next step after the generating station? Uh, step up transformer. Step up transformer. There you go. Comes out of the step up transformer, and where does it go into? Switch yard. Switch yard. You show bus in your switch yard. So I've got no problem with this. I've seen plenty of students do it before. That if you've got a picture that explains multiple components, you can use it multiple times. So I can actually show this is my generating station. If you want to include a generator, that's fine. I can include this as my step up transformer. I can include this as my switch yard. I can include this as my bus. That takes care of how many did you say? Four or five. That, that, that takes care of four slides in one picture. Okay. Anybody got any questions? Who's going to redo their PowerPoints? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you do understand. I mean, if you got something started and you've sent it to me, uh, you know, you could you could resend, do whatever you want to do. Everybody knows this, knows the address, correct? Yeah. Okay. Elw dot htc at, um, at gmail dot com. Uh, with that today, we were talking earlier. We're going to go out today on five hundred one to those uh, poles that we have close to the 501, the tall ones, but we're not gonna go up high and we're gonna show you the method to uh, hang transformers. And anything else that you wanna practice out there in the field also. So how's everybody feeling about climbing? Everybody feeling comfortable? Mm -hmm. I, I can right. guarantee you, I'm watching you guys and Professor V's watching me, you guys. And I know it looks like, think smart, Think wisely while you're climbing, but it looks like the comfort level is getting a lot better. What do you think, Mr. Professor Verlin? I do. I think you all are doing really good for the amount of time that we spent on poles and or you mm -hmm. have, and um, yeah. you look good. You yeah, look really yeah, good. You do. I, I think 95% uh, uh, of it is you guys have your mind focused on, and you'll get this way, you have your mind focused on what the work is rather than the climbing part of it. Once you start getting those techniques down and remember to keep your knees straight and repositioning your belt and keeping that green belt close up to the, against the pole, once those things begin to be a habit, and that's why we climb so much, once those habits get into place right there, then it's just the work that you have to do. But like we said before, and we'll do this a couple times out there in the field, you strip things out as you climb up and you re rebuild as you come back down. Uh, I like to think of it, Professor V's this way too, because it, it's a Lyman credo. Uh, we like to go the Marine way, which is improvise, overcome, and adapt. Has anybody ever heard that before? Mm -hmm. Pezzi? Right. Yeah. Or <laughs> adapt, improvise, and overcome. Uh, the improvised part you got to look out for is improvise safely. So, you, you know, you, you'll see it with me. You'll see with uh, Professor Vermelin, and I like to put this out to you guys. 
we're not the say all end all do all. If you're up there climbing and you see a different way or technique to do something that you think is going to work, I want you guys to go ahead and try it. Now, if you tell us before you're going to try it, because there are some things that out there that are, we, we tried before and just don't work. Uh, think of, think of this one. Uh, who's changed out the double cross arms? Me. Lesnick, uh, Willison, I think. Pezzi, most of you have done that, and it's a two-man operation, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I had a student, and he was a hefty student, 6'7", about 280, uh, grown boy out there, said, well, I want to try it, and I don't want to take the cross arms apart. So his plan was to go up there with a hand line, let the wire down, take the center bolt out, and let both cross arms down as a unit, and bring them back up. Uh, I said, let's go ahead and try it. So we did try it. Now it did work, but it took him 45 minutes to get it done right. And he was a pretty good climber and knew what he was doing. So it just gives you a heads up. I'm willing to try anything once if it's safe, that's gotta be safe right off the bat. And two is if, if you ask me something, I'm gonna say, Hey man, it's been tried before. Mm -hmm. Let's not go and try that. Who, um, uh, Professor V, who was it on the dead end pole, the last climber this past Friday? Lesnick and was it Whittington? Lesnick and Whittington? It was me. It was, yeah, it was Wilson, it wasn't me. Okay. Wilson, when, when we had to put the neutral back up and you didn't have the sling, what did we do? Uh, we just hooked the block up to the ground wire. But that was the guy wire. Okay. If there's got wire. Yeah. I mean, look at your look at your full environment right there and don't think that use what you have available is what I'm trying to say. We just went further back and found a hook point that was close to the neutral and being in line with the neutral. We just put the hand line in there, pulled the neutral up, and he, he got it in the hole and tightened it up. So it's time to do a little and I, I like it in this class, do a little problem solving. If you run into something, by all means, ask us questions, ask Professor V and I questions. But uh, if you guys run into something and said, well, I'm not 100% sure of how I'm gonna get this transformer up the pole in this situation, uh, do a little problem solving. One thing that I have liked, and Professor V will attest to this also, uh, if you've changed out the single cross arm, do you let it down on the neutral side of the pole or on the other side of the pole where the neutral's not there? Anybody? If you let it, it down is. on the neutral side, it's just gonna catch it on the way down, right? Fantastic, there you go. Yeah, that's just a little common sense and something you've got to forecast and look out for. When, as soon as you start hanging that hand line up at the top and throwing your ropes down, I've got to throw them down on the non-neutral side. So my cross arm goes down the non-neutral side, it won't get tangled up in the neutral. And you ground people when you send the cross arm back up, get the rope out of the way of the climber that's up there so it doesn't get caught on the cross arm when it goes back up. You'd be uh, surprised of how one little positioning thing can save a lot of time and a lot of headache in changing out cross arms and doing any, any kind of your work that goes on out there. All right, Professor V, anything else before we wrap up? I'd say as well, don't be in a big hurry to, well, you know, stay at a, at a steady pace when you're working up there. Don't don't just try to rush, 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 rush. You, you're liable to forget a step or two or drop something, and of course that's gonna be a fail. Uh, don't be in a hurry to let your hand line down until you know you're done with it. Oh. You let your hand line down and then, oh, I don't have my hammer. How are you gonna get your hammer? Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. Yeah, wow. That, those were two great ones right there. And I've seen, to be honest, I, I know a couple of people have changed out the single cross arm and have done it under time already. Yeah. Which is great. The time, really, gentlemen, is based off of what they call drop dead times in rodeos. So you got plenty of time to be able to get these tasks done. But I, the drop of one washer is yep. game over. Uh, and I've seen, <laughs> I, 
if and I'll pick on just because Lesnick's right here. I'll pick on Lesnick for just a moment, even though I haven't even seen him do it. Lesnick goes up and he changes out the cross arm, gets the cross arm on the pole, throws the hand line down. All right, starts coming down, goes in his pouch, hard head falls out of his hand. Well, guess what? Done. He's done. For one, he's done on the drop. Two is he's going to have to climb down, get the hand line, climb back up, and put the hard head in. All right. Uh, time stops when? Hard head. As soon as you knock that hard head in the pole, time stops. So you got plenty of time to mess with that hand line. And you know, it's not included in the time period. So send it, send it down last. Great, great one, Robbie. I, that, that one kind of gets on my nerves. Go ahead. Yeah, one more thing, guys. If you're up the pole like transform or devil arm or something, and you see that there's something wrong up there that needs to be fixed. You know, bring it to our attention. Let's get it fixed now. Um, that way somebody else doesn't have to go up there and struggle with it. If, if it requires a good bit of work, let us know. We'll go up there and help fix it with you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any questions, other questions today? The uh, project is due by midnight tonight, and then we'll start going through them tomorrow. That's all. I will post this video in Remind. And I will post that sheet that I had, that Word document. I'll, I can do that in Remind too. I'll post that in Remind also so you guys can have it. So if there's no further questions, gentlemen, that'll be all for the online portion of the day. And I will see you guys out there at the field. At 1230. That is correct. All right. All right. See you then. All right. Have a good day. Uh, you too.